Welcome back to Another World Audiobooks. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Super excited about today's episode. We get uh, Tarzan back in his element. I mean, obviously, you know, Tarzan in Paris, it's, it's interesting, but, you know, you want to see Tarzan doing some action in the jungle. That's that's what you come for. So, you are going to get that in today's episode. Uh, first of all, though, I wanted to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, to Mike and Corky and Etiosa for sponsoring the show and making this possible. So, if you would like to become a, a sponsor, you can go to another otherworldaudiobooks.com. I would greatly appreciate it. Even if you don't want to become a sponsor, if you want to check out some of the merchandise, if you want to buy some of our uh, audiobooks from the Another World library there, uh, go ahead and yeah, check that out. Go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com. And if you just want to shout out on the show or potentially a free audiobook, go ahead and share it on social media. If you get me tagged in there and I see it, uh, I will make sure to give you a huge shout out on the show. So, All right, now let's get into it. Without further ado, I give you chapter 15 of The Return of Tarzan. Chapter 15 From Ape to Savage The noise of their battle with Numa had drawn an excited horde of savages from the nearby village, and a moment after the lion's death, the two men were surrounded by lithe ebon warriors, gesticulating and jabbering, a thousand questions that drowned each ventured reply. And then the women came, and the children, eager, curious, and, at sight of Tarzan, more questioning than ever. The ape-man's new friend finally succeeded in making himself heard, and when he had done talking, the men and women of the village vied with one another in doing honour to the strange creature who had saved their fellow and battled single-handed with fierce Numa. At last they led him back to their village, where they brought him gifts of fowl and goats and cooked food. When he pointed to their weapons, the warriors hastened to fetch spear, shield, arrow, and a bow. His friend of the encounter presented him with the knife with which he had killed Numa. There was nothing in all the village that he could not have had for the asking. How much easier this was, thought Tarzan, than murder and robbery to supply his wants. How close he had been to killing this man whom he never had seen before, and who now was manifesting by every primitive means at his command friendship and affection for his would-be slayer. Tarzan of the apes was ashamed. Hereafter, he would at least wait until he knew men deserved it before he thought of killing them. The idea recalled Rokoff to his mind. He wished that he might have the Russian to himself in the dark jungle for a few minutes. There was a man who deserved killing, if ever anyone did. And if he could have seen Rokoff at that moment, as he assiduously bent every endeavor to the pleasant task of ingratiating himself into the affections of the beautiful Miss Strong, he would have longed more than ever to mete out to the man the fate he deserved. Tarzan's first night with the savages was devoted to a wild orgy in his honor. There was feasting, for the hunters had brought in an antelope and a zebra as trophies of their skill, and gallons of the weak native beer were consumed. As the warriors danced in the firelight, Tarzan was again impressed by the symmetry of their figures and the regularity of their features. The flat noses and thick lips of the typical West Coast savage were entirely missing. In repose, the faces of the men were intelligent and dignified, those of the women oft-times prepossessing. It was during this dance that the ape-man first noticed that some of the men and many of the women wore ornaments of gold, principally anklets and armlets of great weight, apparently beaten out of the solid metal. When he expressed the wish to examine one of these, the owner removed it from her person and insisted, through the medium of signs, that Tarzan accept it as a gift. A close scrutiny of the bauble convinced the ape-man that the article was of virgin gold, and he was surprised, for it was the first time that he had ever seen golden ornaments among the savages of Africa, other than the trifling baubles those near the coast had purchased or stolen from Europeans. He tried to ask them from whence the metal came, but he could not make them understand. When the dance was done, Tarzan signified his intention to leave them, but they almost implored him to accept the hospitality of a great hut which the chief set apart for his sole use. He tried to explain that he would return in the morning, but they could not understand. When he finally walked away from them toward the side of the village opposite the gate, they were still further mystified as to his intentions. Tarzan, however, knew just what he was about. In the past, he had had experience with the rodents and vermin that infested every native village, and while he was not over-scrupulous about such matters, he much preferred the fresh air of the swaying trees to the fetid atmosphere of a hut. The natives followed him to where a great tree overhung the palisade. 
and as Tarzan leaped for a lower branch and disappeared into the foliage above, precisely after the manner of Manu, the monkey, there were loud exclamations of surprise and astonishment. For half an hour they called to him to return, but as he did not answer them, they at last desisted and sought the sleeping mats within their huts. Tarzan went back into the forest a short distance until he had found a tree suited to his primitive requirements, and then, curling himself in a great crotch, he fell immediately into a deep sleep. The following morning he dropped into the village street as suddenly as he had disappeared the preceding night. For a moment the natives were startled and afraid, but when they recognized their guest of the night before, they welcomed him with shouts and laughter. That day he accompanied a party of warriors to the nearby plains on a great hunt, and so dexterous did they find this white man with their own crude weapons that another bond of respect and admiration was thereby wrought. For weeks Tarzan lived with his savage friends, hunting buffalo, antelope, and zebra for meat, and elephants for ivory. Quickly he learned their simple speech, their native customs, and the ethics of their wild, primitive tribal life. He found that they were not cannibals, that they looked with loathing and contempt upon men who ate men. Busuli, the warrior whom he had stalked to the village, told him many of the tribal legends, how many years before his people had come many long marches from the north, how once they had been a great and powerful tribe, and how the slave raiders had wrought such havoc among them with their death-dealing guns that they had been reduced to a mere remnant of their former numbers and power. They hunted us down as one hunts a fierce beast, said Besuli. There was no mercy in them. When it was not slaves they sought, it was ivory, but usually it was both. Our men were killed and our women driven away like sheep. We fought against them for many years, but our arrows and spears could not prevail against the sticks which spit fire and lead and death to many times the distance that our mightiest warriors could place an arrow. At last, when my father was a young man, the Arabs came again, but our warriors saw them a long way off, and Chowambi, who was our chief then, told his people to gather up their belongings and come away with him, that he would lead them far to the south until they found a spot to which the Arab raiders did not come. And they did as he bid, carrying all their belongings, including many tusks of ivory. For months they wandered, suffering untold hardships and privations, for much of the way was through dense jungle and across mighty mountains, but finally they came to this spot, and although they sent parties farther on to search for an even better location, none has ever been found. And the raiders have never found you here? asked Tarzan. About a year ago, a small party of Arabs and Mani Yuma stumbled upon us, but we drove them off, killing many. For days we followed them, stalking them for the wild beasts they are, picking them off one by one, until but a handful remained, but these escaped us. As Busuli talked, he fingered a heavy gold armlet that encircled the glossy hide of his left arm. Tarzan's eyes were upon the ornament, but his thoughts were elsewhere. Presently, he recalled the question he had tried to ask when he first came to the tribe, the question he could not at that time make them understand. For weeks he had forgotten so trivial a thing as gold, for he had been for the time a truly primeval man, with no thought beyond today. But of a sudden, the sight of gold awakened the sleeping civilization that was in him, and with it came the lust for wealth. That lesson Tarzan had learned well in his brief experience of the ways of civilized man. He knew that gold meant power and pleasure. He pointed to the bauble. From whence comes the yellow metal, Basuli? he asked. The black pointed to the southeast. A moon's march away, maybe more, he replied. Have you been there? asked Tarzan. No, but some of our people were there years ago, when my father was yet a young man. One of the parties that searched farther for a location for the tribe when first they settled here came upon a strange people who wore many ornaments of yellow metal. Their spears were tipped with it, as were their arrows, and they cooked in vessels made all of solid metal like my armlet. They lived in a great village in huts that were built of stone and surrounded by a great wall. They were very fierce, rushing out and falling upon our warriors before ever they learned that their errand was a peaceful one. Our men were few in number, but they held their own at the top of a little rocky hill until the fierce people went back at sunset into their wicked city. Then our warriors came down from their hill, and, after taking many ornaments of yellow metal from the bodies of those they had slain, they marched back out of the valley, 
nor have any of us ever returned. They are wicked people, neither white like you nor black like me, but covered with hair, as Bulgani the gorilla. Yes, they are very bad people indeed, and Chowambi was glad to get out of their country. And are none of those alive who were with Chowambi and saw these strange people in their wonderful city? asked Tarzan. Waziri, our chief, was there, replied Busuli. He was a very young man then, but he accompanied Chowambi, who was his father. So that night, Tarzan asked Waziri about it, and Waziri, who was now an old man, said that it was a long march, but that the way was not difficult to follow. He remembered it well. For ten days we followed this river which runs beside our village. Up toward its source we travelled, until, on the tenth day, we came to a little spring far up upon the side of a lofty mountain range. In this little spring our river is born. The next day we crossed over the top of the mountain, and upon the other side we came to a tiny rivulet which we followed down into a great forest. For many days we travelled along the winding banks of the rivulet which had now become a river, until we came to a greater river, into which it emptied, and which ran down the centre of a mighty valley. Then we followed this larger river toward its source, hoping to come to more open land. After twenty days of marching from the time we had crossed the mountains and passed out of our own country, we came again to another range of mountains. Up the side we followed the great river, that had now dwindled to a tiny rivulet, until we came to a little cave near the mountain top. In this cave was the mother of the river. I remember that we camped there that night, and that it was very cold, for the mountains were high. The next day we decided to ascend to the top of the mountains, and see what the country upon the other side looked like, and if it seemed no better than that which we had so far traversed, we would return to our village, and tell them they had already found the best place in all the world to live. And so we clambered up the face of the rocky cliffs until we reached the summit, and there, from a flat mountain top, we saw, not far beneath us, a shallow valley, very narrow, and upon the far side of it was a great village of stone, much of which had fallen and crumbled into decay. The balance of Waziri's story was practically the same as that which Bazuli had told. I should like to go there and see this strange city, said Tarzan, and get some of their yellow metal from its fierce inhabitants. It is a long march, replied Waziri, and I am an old man, but if you will wait until the rainy season is over and the rivers have gone down, I will take some of my warriors and go with you. And Tarzan had to be contented with that arrangement, though he would have liked it well enough to have set off the next morning. He was as impatient as a child. Really, Tarzan of the Apes was but a child, or a primeval man, which is the same thing in a way. The next day, but one of a small party of hunters returned to the village from the south to report a large herd of elephants some miles away. By climbing trees, they had a fairly good view of the herd, which they described as numbering several large tuskers, a great many cows and calves, and full-grown bulls, whose ivory would be worth having. The balance of the day and evening were filled with preparations for a great hunt. Spears were overhauled, quivers were replenished, bows were restrung, and all the while the village witch-doctors passed through the busy throngs, disposing of various charms and amulets designed to protect the possessors from hurt, or bring him good fortune in the morrow's hunt. At dawn the hunters were off. They were fifty sleek black warriors, and in their midst, lithe and active as a young forest god, strode Tarzan of the apes, his brown skin contrasting oddly with the ebony of his companions. Except for color, he was one of them. His ornaments and weapons were the same as theirs. He spoke their language. He laughed and joked with them, and leaped and shouted in the brief wild dance that preceded their departure from the village, to all intent and purpose a savage among savages. Nor, had he questioned himself, is it to be doubted that he would have admitted that he was far more closely allied to these people and their life than to the Parisian friends whose ways, ape-like, he had successfully mimicked for a few short months. But he did think of Deonaut, and a grin of amusement showed his strong white teeth as he pictured the immaculate Frenchman's expression could he by some means see Tarzan as he was that minute. 
Poor Paul, who had prided himself on having eradicated from his friend the last traces of wild savagery. How quickly have I fallen, thought Tarzan, but in his heart he did not consider it a fall. Rather, he pitied the poor creatures of Paris, penned up like prisoners in their silly clothes, and watched by policemen all their poor lives, that they might do nothing that was not entirely artificial and tiresome. A two-hours march brought them close to the vicinity in which the elephants had been seen the previous day. From there on, they moved very quietly indeed, searching for the spore of the great beasts. At length, they found the well-marked trail along which the herd had passed not many hours before. In single file, they followed it for almost half an hour. It was Tarzan who first raised his hand in signal that the quarry was at hand. His sensitive nose had warned him that the elephants were not far ahead of them. The blacks were skeptical when he told them how he knew. "'Come with me,' said Tarzan, "'and we shall see.' With the agility of a squirrel, he sprang into a tree and ran nimbly to the top. One of the blacks followed more slowly and carefully. When he had reached a lofty limb beside the ape-man, the latter pointed to the south, and there, some few hundred yards away, the blacks saw a number of huge black backs swaying back and forth along the top of the lofty jungle grasses. He pointed the direction to the watchers below, indicating with his fingers the number of beasts he could count. Immediately, the hunters started toward the elephants. The black in the tree hastened down, but Tarzan stalked, after his own fashion, along the leafy way of the middle terrace. It is no child's play to hunt wild elephants with the crude weapons of primitive man. Tarzan knew that few native tribes ever attempted it, and the fact that his tribe did so gave him no little pride. Already he was commencing to think of himself as a member of the little community. As Tarzan moved silently through the trees, he saw the warriors below creeping in a half-circle upon the still unsuspecting elephants. Finally, they were within sight of the great beasts. Now they singled out two large tuskers, and, at a signal, the fifty men rose from the ground where they had lain concealed, and hurled their heavy war-spears at the two marked beasts. There was not a single miss. Twenty-five spears were embedded in the side of each of the giant animals. One never moved from the spot where it stood when the avalanche of spears struck it, for two, perfectly aimed, had penetrated its heart, and it lunged forward upon its knees, rolling to the ground without a struggle. The other, standing nearly head-on toward the hunters, had not proved so good a mark, and though every spear struck, not one entered the great heart. For a moment, the huge bull stood trumpeting in rage and pain, casting about with its little eyes for the author of its hurt. The blacks had faded into the jungle before the weak eyes of the monster had fallen upon any of them, but now he caught the sound of their retreat, and, amid a terrific crashing of underbrush and branches, he charged in the direction of the noise. It so happened that chance sent him in the direction of Busuli, whom he was overtaking so rapidly that it was as though the black was standing still instead of racing at full speed to escape the certain death which pursued him. Tarzan had witnessed the entire performance from the branches of a nearby tree, and now that he saw his friend's peril, he raced toward the infuriated beast with loud cries, hoping to distract him. But it had been as well had he saved his breath for the brute was deaf and blind to all else save the particular object of his rage that raced futilely before him. And now Tarzan saw that only a miracle could save Basuli, and with the same unconcern with which he had once hunted this very man, he hurled himself into the path of the elephant to save the black warrior's life. He still grasped his spear, and while Tantor was yet six or eight paces behind his prey, a sinewy white warrior dropped as one from the heavens, almost directly in his path. With a vicious lunge, the elephant swerved to the right to dispose of this temerarious foeman who dared intervene between himself and his intended victim. But he had not reckoned on the lightning quickness that could galvanize those steel muscles into action so marvelously swift as to baffle even a keener eyesight than Tantor's. And so it happened that before the elephant realized that his new enemy had leaped from his path, Tarzan had driven his iron-shod spear from behind the massive shoulder, straight into the fierce heart, and the colossal pachyderm had toppled to his death at the feet of the ape-man. Basuli had not beheld the manner of his deliverance, but Waziri, the old chief, had seen, and several of the other warriors, and they hailed Tarzan with delight as they swarmed about him and his great kill. When he leaped upon the mighty carcass and gave voice to the weird challenge with which he announced a great victory, the blacks shrank back in fear, 
for to them it marked the brutal Borgani, whom they feared fully as much as they feared Numa the lion, but with a fear with which was mixed a certain uncanny awe of the manlike thing to which they attributed supernatural powers. But when Tarzan lowered his raised head and smiled upon them, they were reassured, though they did not understand. Nor did they ever fully understand this strange creature who ran through the trees as quickly as Manu, yet was even more at home upon the ground than themselves, who was, except as to colour like unto themselves, yet as powerful as ten of them, and single-handed a match for the fiercest denizens of the fierce jungle. When the remainder of the warriors had gathered, the hunt was again taken up, and the stalking of the retreating herd once more begun. But they had covered a bare hundred yards, when from behind them, at a great distance, sounded faintly a strange popping. For an instant they stood like a group of statuary, intently listening. Then Tarzan spoke. "'Guns,' he said. "'The village is being attacked!' "'Come!' cried Waziri. The Arab raiders have returned with their cannibal slaves for our ivory and our women. Never a dull moment around Tarzan, I tell you. Thanks, guys, for listening today. Hope you're enjoying the book so far. Remember, if you want to catch the uh, first Tarzan book that we did, you can go ahead and go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com, and uh, all the links to all the past books that we have done are there, or you can just go back in the podcast archive here and all the backlist. It's like, uh, oh, man, we're, we got to be pushing like 180 episodes on the show. I just can't believe that. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, so thank you for listening. Thank you for making this possible. Thank you for sharing the podcast. That is really the biggest thing. People ask me, what can I do? To, to help the, the podcast get bigger what can I do to help you be able to make more episodes and the biggest thing the biggest thing is just telling other people about it because uh, podcasts are really hard to get discovered <laughs> uh, you, there's a billion podcasts out there so the main way that podcasts actually get more listeners is by existing listeners telling other people about the podcast so I need your help to make that happen and as a thank you I've got all kinds of free audiobooks I can send your way so make it happen people and uh, I'll make those those free audiobooks start flowing all right we will be back next week with chapter 16 until then take care When I was in school, I absolutely hated writing. It wasn't until I was a bit older that I came to understand the power of words. If you're a business owner, you understand that power too. A business blog, when done right, can drive sales, increase revenue, and get you more customers. But as a business owner, you probably don't have the time to do all that writing. Plus, if you're not a copywriter by trade, you might feel like you're just kind of throwing words out there and they're not actually accomplishing anything. The good news is, there's a simple solution. Check it out. I call it the ultimate blog post checklist for businesses with online stores. This checklist will allow you to write better, more effective articles that convert readers into buyers. It's full of easy-to-follow examples to get your creativity flowing based on experience of nearly a million words written, and best of all, it's effective on any type of article in any industry or niche. I've successfully used this exact checklist on topics from pool table reviews to investment advice. Tired of spending tons of time writing stuff that doesn't convert? This checklist will change that by giving you highly effective blog posts and articles that transform readers into paying customers. Go to invicta.enterprises slash free checklist and start saving time and transforming your writing now. That's invicta.enterprises slash free checklist.